Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Aquarium Online Academy. My name is James. I work in the education department here at the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach. Now, I have Dana at the controls. Jen is helping at the controls. Welcome back, Jen. Luke is over answering questions. He's going to give us the questions in the studio that we can answer, too. So Dana's going to put up the text number. Now, there's going to be a lot of questions, but we may not get to all of them. We'll get to as many as we can. And any that we can't answer on air, Luke will be able to answer for us on the computer. But text this number right here at 562 286 1838 and we'll get your messages here in the studio. Now, we can't receive phone calls, but we do receive the text messages. Now, if you're not watching live, there's also a way to participate. You can email us at live at lbaop.org. So if you are watching live today on Monday the 18th, go ahead and ask us questions because we're going to be talking about one of the coolest animals in the ocean, sharks. Do you like sharks? I like sharks. Dane is giggling because... Our friend Sarah loves sharks. So, Sarah is probably going to be asking Luke lots of questions. Not really. She already knows everything about sharks. Sarah should answer our questions. Okay. Well, let's just let's do some observation because we're all scientists. We're all going to participate. Even if we're not texting in, we're going to use our powers of observation. We're going to be thinking, asking questions, which is what scientists do. They observe something. They ask a question so we can learn more. All right. So, let's take a look at some sharks and let's see what we can come up with now we also have a shark lagoon exhibit we'll check in with and see what's going on live at the shark habitat but let's make some initial observations from a picture of a shark and let's see what we come up with about this animal what do you notice do you know this kind of shark it's only this big no it's actually a very big shark do you want to know how big this shark is okay you might need some friends around you, or you could have a measuring tape, or you could just use your imagination. So, if you want to know how big this shark is, any of our younger viewers that are about the third, to grade, third through fifth grade level, if you wanted to start and just stand up, put your arms out like this. Like you're going to try and hug, but we're not going to because we're socially distancing. <gasps> you, that's about three feet, right? You got this big like V going like you're, woo! Yeah, doing that. That's three feet. Now, you need six more friends to join you. So that it's okay if there's not six of you in the room. But guess what? You could have everybody like line up on a video camera too. And yet seven of you together, that's about the length of this shark. So this is the great white shark. It's about 20 feet long on the big end. Now, when we talk about animals, we always mention the biggest that they are. We never really talk about the averages. The biggest great white shark, I think, was measured at about 22 feet and maybe three or four thousand pounds i don't remember the weight because they're very big but the shark that we have here is what we commonly think of as sharks do all sharks look like this well there's a lot that look like this but there's a lot of sharks that they don't even look like sharks because they're very different from this stereotypical great white shark but what do we see on the great white shark hmm. i can see uh, eyeballs yeah they got eyes uh, very happy smile. Mm -hmm. They're very happy sharks. I noticed, I noticed gills. These lines right here are the gills. What else do sharks have? They have fins. All right. Well, this helps me in helping you learn about the body of a shark. We're going to draw our shark friend here. Where's my marker? Oh, there's my marker. I can't draw on the screen, is it? We gotta draw. Oh, we gotta draw this way. So there's a green, green fabric behind me. If I draw on that, it's not gonna work out. So if we wanted to draw a shark, what shape is there? Is our shark here? They're kind of football-y, but they don't have frowns like giant sea bass. They have smiles. Hmm. So now, football shape in fish, we actually has a special name. It's kind of like a, a flattened lemon almost. So this shape right here, this is called fusiform. So fusiform is kind of a lemon football shape. So if we wanted to draw a shark, you could draw along if you want. You don't have to draw a shark with us. You could wait till our draw with us class to draw a shark. But we start with our fusiform lemony shape. Now, we had the eyes, right? Let's give them a nice eyeball. And do sharks have eyelashes? This one does. This one might, but do all... 
Well, sharks don't really have eyelashes. Do you see any eyelashes on a shark here? No. Mammals have hair. So mammals have eyelashes. Some of us have sometimes thought that eyelashes only mean female. Well, we all have eyelashes. They're great for keeping dust out of our eyes. Do sharks have to worry about that? No, they have special eyelids. It's a see-through eyelid that they can close over their eye called a nictitating membrane that keeps them from getting stuff in their eyes. So they don't need eyelashes. But we're going to give our shark a very happy, toothy smile. And here's some teeth. Do those look like shark teeth? No? Very critical of my drawing skills. All right, let's try it again. Let's try and make some shark teeth. Triangle teeth. That's right. We want to make some triangle, kind of big toothy teeth. Ah, there's our shark. Now we have the gills. One, two, three, four, five. If you look at our shark here, we can see all five gill slits. There's this one way in the back, kind of ends right in front of the pectoral fin. So we have five gill slits, and that's the average between all the types of sharks. There's only a couple that have more than five. Now, scientists haven't found one that has less, as far as I know. But if they have more than five, they have very, very cool names. Do you want to know the names? All right. The one with six gills is called the six-gill shark. Sometimes the names are just describing names. All right. Maybe the shark with seven gills has a different name. More, whoa, sharky, cool, is it? Nope, it's the seven-gill shark. And that's okay. The six-gill shark and the seven-gill shark. Womp, womp. And that's okay. We can name animals very fun, cool names, or sometimes we're not sure what to call them, and so they just get named after a describing part of their body. Like the green tree frog. It's a frog that's green and lives in trees. Pretty simple, but very accurate name. Now, what should I add to my shark so it looks like this one? Fins! We forgot the fins. Let's get a big dorsal fin. Dorsal means back. Big fin. Now, I, I can't tell on this shark, but there's more fins. Can we get another shark picture that shows us all the fins, Dana? So while Dana's is drawing some fins, or getting us a, a picture with more fins, I'm going to draw some more fins. We got these big pectoral fins right here. All right, so this is as good as we, we have at the moment. But this one's a pretty good one. This is a black tip reef shark. Still very sharky looking shark, right? Okay. Oh, here we go. There's a fin right here. So they have two dorsal fins. Have fins down here. Boop, boop. Right, maybe maybe this is the other pectoral fin hanging out, and then here's another fin right there. Let's just redraw this whole part. Okay, I'm critical of my own artwork too. Oh, and there's a fins right there. Okay, what's back here? How does a shark move? Does it have a propeller? <laughs> no, it doesn't have a propeller. Does it have a big fluffy bunny tail? No. All right, Dana found a picture. Stand by. We have a tail for a shark. This is a very cool picture of a gray reef shark. Look at the look at the shape of this tail. How would you describe this tail? It's got two triangles. All right. So let's draw a big triangle up here, little triangle down here, and they kind of meet like this. This shark is very shark looking, right? But guess what? We forgot something really, really important. One, we forgot a little nose. Do you see the nose right here on our shark? Boop. Sharks have very special noses. They have a pit. They don't breathe through their nose a lot like, uh, they have a pit called a nair, and they can move water in and out, and that's how they would smell. Now, we had some cool questions coming in while I was drawing our shark, so let's ask, or let's answer some of the ones that you've asked. Andrew has asked, what is the smallest kind of shark, and what kind of sharks do we have at the Aquarium of the Pacific? So, we have a number of sharks. We do not have the smallest of all sharks. The smallest of all sharks, I think, that was recently discovered is, is called a pocket shark. It's about the same size as the dwarf lantern shark, which actually fits in the palm of your hand, about seven inches long. So the pocket shark and the dwarf lantern shark are the smallest of all sharks. Now, we talked about a big shark, the great white shark, but that is not the biggest of all sharks. Do you want to know what the biggest of all sharks is? Pretty close. It's this one. 
Now, if you said whale shark, that's right. There's a lot of other big sharks too. The basking shark, the big mouth shark, they're pretty big too. Now, I also have a really special artifact in here that we can have you look at. This one. Whoa. You want to be a mega mouth shark? Just like that. I saw everyone trying to be a mega mouth shark. But this is the jaw of a whale shark. This is a pretty big jaw for a shark that gets 40 to 60 feet long. Now, it's unconfirmed, I think, if it was 60, but we're estimating because we saw it next to something else. And there's not really big teeth in here. Do you see big teeth in there? They have really little teeth. Now, I have a special camera we're going to try and find some teeth on. So hold on. Let me turn the light on our camera. Now, this is a kind of document camera. Now, it's not even big enough to, for me to put this on the camera, so I'm going to have to hold it on the table in a very fun way and try to control the lighting. All right, you ready? Let's check out whale shark teeth. Let's zoom in. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Boop. Wait, wait, what? That's my finger next to all these little tiny, tiny teeth. Tiny teeth. So whale sharks have teeth, but they're so small, they're really not chewing on anything. They're eating plankton. Great job, everyone, taking a look at our shark teeth. So we made observations, right? We were asking questions. Why are their teeth so small? It's because of the food that they eat. All right. Now we had a couple more questions pop in. So Nick from Murrieta is asking, how many kinds of sharks are there? There's a lot of species of sharks. There's over, I believe, 470 different kinds of sharks that we've found so far. Now remember, science is investigation. Science is always learning. So we might find more sharks as we keep going, just like we just discovered the pocket shark. Recently described and confirmed as a new kind of shark, the pocket shark has been added to the list. That's why I can't give you an exact number of sharks because that list changes and the number changes pretty frequently. Okay, now we have a lot of teachers tuning in with their students. Thank you so much for tuning in. We have teachers from Long Beach, San Diego, um, uh, from Grandview Elementary. We have a lot of teachers tuning in. So all of you that are taking your time from your class to help learn about sharks with us today, we appreciate it. We all want you to be able to view as many videos as possible. So don't forget to check out our online academy webpage with a whole lot more resources for you to check everybody out. Okay, we should go back to learning more about the sharks. So let's learn about shark senses. How many senses, how many basic senses do we have? What are the main ones? The five. We've got sight, sound, ah, smell, smell, taste, and touch. So those are our five basic senses. Do sharks have all of those? Yeah, they do. Now, I think there's a video of some of our little sharks at Shark Lagoon we can put into the studio window, and we can talk about how they do what they do. So they swim around. These are the sharks that we can touch. They are in our touch pool, so they're safe to touch. Don't worry. Sharks really don't care about us. They're, we're just a thing on land that likes to touch them. And how do they find their food? Well, they use all their senses to find their food, to explore their environment, just like we explore. Do you ever get a chance to go explore? You could explore your living room. You could explore your bedroom. I would more often explore my bedroom than clean my bedroom when I was a young person. Actually, probably still today, too. But that's okay. We're exploring. We're using our senses, and we're learning about the space. So if I threw a piece of food into the shark lagoon, and the sharks needed to find it, they could use their sound. When the water gets, uh, the food goes into the water, that splashing effect, they can hear that very well. They can hear from a great distance away. So they can hear better they can, than they can see. Now they can see probably at least 50 to 100 feet in the water, depending on how clear the water is. But they can hear for hundreds of feet, if not more. They can also smell. Remember we talked about the shark nose? We added our little dot to our shark drawing for a nose. They can smell one drop of blood or food in one million drops of water. So imagine like a big pool, like an Olympic sized pool. That's about a million drops of water. I've counted, I know. No, I haven't counted, it's fine. It takes a long time to count to a million. Don't try, it'll take you at least a couple of weeks. So sharks can smell very, very small amounts of stuff. 
So that means it's very sensitive that they can tell that the food has been in the water. The thing I love the most about their sense of smell is that they can smell in direction. Just like we could hear if a sound came from left or right, if both ears are working, we can tell what sound was coming from where. Sharks can do that too. They have ears. It's really hard to see them. But they can smell in direction too. Could you imagine if you could tell there are chocolate chip cookies over there and pizza over there? <gasps> That'd be amazing. Then you can make your choices and like pick which one you want. That'd be pretty cool. Right now, all that we can do with a sensitive nature of our nose is tell that there's pizza and cookies somewhere. We can't really smell the direction it came from. So that's pretty cool about shark's smell. Now, the other cool thing about sharks and other fish is they have something called a lateral line. So let's go back to looking at a picture of a shark. And let's see if we can find the lateral line. Sometimes it's really tough to find. It's not easy to see on their body, but other times you can kind of pick out where the line would be. Now Dana's looking for the picture while she's doing that. Um, Mark asked, why don't sharks eat the other fish that they're swimming next to? It's a nice little yellow tang right there. Well, we feed the sharks so often that they don't really want to eat anybody else. But the other thing is, that may not be the kind of food that they would eat. That yellow tang helps clean the algae that's in Shark Lagoon. Not as much as we would like, because we still got to scrub the Shark Lagoon every once in a while. But they do eat other things. And then the sharks like these, they actually eat a lot of crustaceans or uh, like mussels and clams and crabs. And they eat a lot of things that are not like a big fish. The bigger sharks, it's the same thing. We feed them so often, they're not really hungry for anything else. But it's also not necessarily a fish that they would hunt in out in the ocean. So they just aren't really trying to eat them. Okay, Dana's got our picture. This is the leopard shark. This one lives local here to Southern California. The leopard shark is, I think, one of the prettier sharks. I love their skin. Dana is surprised because I would, I would judge other sharks to be less pretty than this one. But this is a very pretty shark. I love the spots and the blotches. They have kind of the leopardy spots, which is why they get the name leopard shark. Now, there's another shark that's nicknamed a leopard shark in Australia, very different. We call the one that lives in Australia a zebra shark because we already have the leopard shark. Now, let's take a look at our leopard shark's skin. Can you see a very slight line down their body? It's really tough. If you're watching on a smaller mobile device, it might be really tough to see, but there's a line right here. It kind of looks like a little tiny ridge That is the lateral line. The lateral line is a sensory organ. Kind of like cats and dogs have whiskers. Have you ever been outside and when the wind is blowing, you can feel the wind in your hair? That's kind of how the lateral line works. It's these tiny little hair-like projections. They're not true hairs because they're not mammals, but the tiny little hair-like projections that can feel the movement of water. So if something moves beside them or splashes, or like when you can feel a big wave coming by, they can feel a little tiny, tiny wave almost microscopic waves because of how sensitive the water line is. Now this is more impressive with certain schooling fish like sardines and mackerels or even yellowfin. These kind of have it too. You can see the little line right there on the bamboo shark. So they can feel each other moving around because they do clump up like this. This is, it's not like we're put too many sharks together. They like to bundle together and hide, look like one big blob of shark so that a predator can't tell who is who so they can't try to grab just one. So a lot of schooling or shoaling animals will group together so it's harder to grab just one individual if you were a predator. So schooling is when all the fish go in the same direction. Like when we're in school and we all, we all walk in the line to the lunchroom, we're all going together. Shoaling is kind of like the hallway where everybody's going the same direction, sort of, but not really. And oh, I, may, I might go this way, I might go back this way. Shoaling is grouping, but not going in the same direction. All right, let's take a look at the bonnet head's lateral line. There's is really distinct. You can see it right there as it swims by. Now a bonnet head is a hammerhead. You, look, it's, it is a hammerhead. It's just a much smaller version of a hammerhead. The bonnet heads only get about four, maybe five feet long at the most. So they're very small hammerhead compared to the other hammerheads. Even the next largest hammerhead is about twice the size of the bonnet head. So it is a kind of hammerhead. Did you watch how it was swimming? What direction was the tail of the shark going? Was the shark tail doing this? No, that's how whales swim. What was the shark tail doing? It's going side to side. Yeah. And remember, their fins 
help them do a lot. So we didn't even, ugh, I forgot to talk about what the fins are doing. There, we skipped over all the fun stuff. The fins help them swim in direction. So now Dana was talking last class about the, the football shape of sharks, and if they didn't have fins, they might spin like a spiral. So when you watch their bodies, their whole body is moving. They're very flexible because their skeleton is made of cartilage. And when they're swimming, the tail is pushing. If you want to be like big guy, yeah. we're going to pretend to be him. We're going to do one of these. He's moving his tail. And what do the fins on the side do? They steer. So you can watch the sharks. They'll change direction of the fins. And the fins help them move left or right. So these are for steering. These are the pectoral fins, like we have pectoral muscles right in our arms. That helps them steer, like airplane wings. The tail helps push them, and the top fins help guide them so they don't spin or turn in the water when they don't need to. Now those bamboo sharks, they didn't have the same kinds of fins. Their dorsal fins are much smaller, and they actually are scooted much further back on the body. That's because they like to grab food out of the coral. So if they have to stick their face into the coral to grab their food, they don't want to get stuck with their fin. It's like if you had your backpack on and you tried crawling under the table, your backpack gets stuck. Oh, yeah. Well, you don't want that to happen if you're a bamboo shark because you have to get the little food out of the little nooks and crannies and you don't want anything stopping you from getting in there. All right, let's take a look at our Shark Lagoon webcam if we can because we should look at the bigger sharks in our live exhibit and see what they're doing. Let's see if we can make some more observations about the big sharks too. We have gray reef sharks. We didn't answer all the what kinds of sharks. We have gray reef sharks and black tip reef sharks in Shark Lagoon. We have behind the scenes, which means they're not on exhibit right now. Behind the scenes, we have a sand tiger shark, like the big one we are pretending to move like. And the white tip reef sharks are behind the scenes right now. We have that bonnet head, the bamboo sharks, the brown banded and the white spotted. We also have epaulette sharks, which are the little sharks that we can touch in the touch pool that have... Kind of a cream colored body with dark spots. We also have zebra sharks. Now zebra sharks are probably one of the more famous ones at the aquarium. While the other sharks look way more sharky and a little bit more interesting as sharks, the zebra sharks, that's not a zebra shark, the zebra shark right there has had babies in a very special way. So we've done some research observationally. It's not like we test on them. We observe what the animals are doing and we can write about it. So this is a zebra shark. Very stripy. No? All right. Very spotty. Which is why the Australians will call them a leopard shark. Because they have spots, like a leopard. But we already have our leopard shark. Now, when they're babies, they have black and white stripes. As they age, the stripes fade into this brown or sandy colored bands of spots. And then just completely spots when they get older. Our zebra sharks have had babies in very special ways. Where we found out that we could have babies with these sharks in a uh, veterinary care setting where they could probably reproduce more often or faster if we're trying to repopulate the sharks. So that's really cool is that we can get them to have babies more often by kind of helping them out, not by hurting or doing anything wrong, by helping them out so they can have more babies. And that way more sharks like them out in the ocean or like them might have a better chance of repopulating if there's not very many of them. Now there's one observation I just made. Why isn't Get out of the way. Why isn't the zebra shark swimming like our black tip reef shark that got in the way? What is this shark doing? Don't worry. She's okay. It's not swimming like the other sharks, though. Well, there's two ways you can breathe as a shark. They all breathe with gills. Remember they have the gills on the side? You can either be what's called a ram ventilator, which is swimming around and pushing the water over your gills. Could you imagine trying to breathe as a person like that? Just walking around and trying to walk fast enough that the air would go in your lungs and then stopping so it could come out of your lung. Our bodies are not built for that, but their gills are designed like a one-way system. They can just keep swimming and the water pushes over the gills and they can breathe. Now this one down here is called, was doing what's called buckle or mouth pumping. So just like a goldfish at home, if you ever had a, a fish tank for a, a pet, you can have your pet fish, they're pumping water over their gills. So they have a special part kind of on the back of their head that looks like a nose on the back of your head called spiracles. The spiracles are where the water comes out of. Now, they don't have to have the water come out of the spiracle. It can come out of the gills. But if their face is in the sand, the water can come out of the, or come, come in the spiracle and come out their gills. So if you're a stingray, I do not have an example of stingray. If you're a stingray and your face is in the sand, you can't inhale 
the sand, that's not going to be good for your gills. So the air, or the water comes through the spiracles, like breathing in through your nose, and then pumps out the gills. Now, some of our sharks, they kind of break the rules. Our sand tiger shark figured out he could sit in front of the vent of freshly filtered water, just kind of hang out there with his mouth open and let the water pump over his gills without having to work for it. So he figured out a way to kind of do what he needed to, but he could sit still. So sharks are pretty smart too. All right, then I found a video of some pumping. So take a look. The spiracles are on the back of the head, right about there. -ish. All right, let's watch it one more time. Now, it's kind of a darker video, so it's okay if you can't quite see it. But what you're noticing is that the gills right here, even though she's not moving, are pulsing. So she's pulled water in through either her mouth or in through her spiracles and is pumping out the gills. So sharks and rays, their cousins, can do all of this. All sharks have spiracles. It's just that some sharks, the spiracles are so small and reduced, you can't quite tell that they're there anymore. So like the black tip reef shark, the great white, they're there, but they're so small that they don't really use them anymore. And that's kind of how it happens with adaptation. When animals adapt or change parts of their body over long periods of time, like many generations, to survive their habitat better. So if you didn't have the ability to pump water, but you needed to, those that could survive longer or have more babies more often than those that don't have that ability. So when things are adapting or evolving, it's because some characteristics of their body are more successful or better suited for where they live. And so they more often show back up in the population. Kind of like if it was better to have red hair or black hair or brown hair, if there's some reason that that helped us survive longer in our life. That's why that becomes more prevalent in certain areas. So that's how adaptation and evolution kind of work in a very simple, short way to describe it. All right. Uh, do we have any other questions coming in, Luke? Uh, yeah. Are sharks prey to any animals? Mark, that Mark is asking, are sharks ever prey to animals? Yes, they are. In the ocean, animals kind of eat things very closely related to each other. So sometimes sharks eat other sharks. Or sometimes there's other animals that might try to eat a shark, like a sea lion can eat sharks. Now, they may not eat a great white shark because that's much bigger than them. But a sea lion might eat a small shark, like a swell shark, or even I've seen, I think uh, in California here, a thresher shark was being eaten by a sea lion. So they might eat something that's smaller than them. So a shark, if it's a small shark, it might get eaten by a bigger animal, many different kinds of predators. Now sharks range, remember, in a wide variety of sizes, they could be seven inches like your hand or 60 feet long. So if it's a smaller shark, it might get eaten by a bigger predator. Oh, here's fern moving. Uh, Loki's asking, do sharks sleep? We saw fern on the ground. Was, was fern dreaming? Oh, fish. Mm, we don't know. Sharks do rest. They don't sleep like we do. So when we sleep, our conscious mind, what we think about and do, what we actively are working on, that closes down a little bit and our subconscious can help operate things. Sharks, as far as we know, don't have that, but we also haven't researched enough about it. It's hard to scan a shark's brain because they do that all the time and water and electronics are not the best of friends. So when sharks are resting, what we found out is that they're kind of on like autopilot or like when you sleepwalk. So parts of their brain are closed down, so they're not as active mentally, but they're still doing stuff. Remember, if you have to move to breathe, you can't stop moving unless you're like the sand tiger shark who figured that one out, but you have to keep going. So if they have to keep moving to breathe, they still have to swim and then the other parts of the brain kind of shut down for a little bit. So it's very short instances that they're resting or sleeping rather than like six to eight hours for a human where we're, our brains are pretty much shut down in, in the conscious way. Our brains are actually extremely active at night. So that's a very different thing about us too. Uh, a, number of kids been asking about the whale sharks. a lot of you have been asking about whale sharks. This is our whale shark. This thing on top of the whale shark, this is called a remora. Remoras are not trying to hurt the shark. They're hitching a ride. Remoras will hang out with the whale shark, sometimes sitting on the whale shark because they have this very special patch on their forehead that will allow them to suction onto an animal. 
And what they do is they pick off leftovers that are nearby. Or in some cases, other animals will have other fish that hang out with them too, like pilot fish hang out with other sharks. And they're kind of eating leftovers or just hanging out with a big animal. Because if you were only this big and you had a 40 foot long best friend, chances are animals don't want to mess with your 40 foot best friend. So you get to hang out and survive a little bit longer. So that's a remora hanging out with a whale shark. The whale sharks have spots on their bodies, even when they are very little. I think they start out at about, what, 15, 18 inches long, Dana? Sure. Dana says, sure. Sarah's going to correct me if I'm wrong. So they, they start out, they're little. They get real big. So they get 20, 40 foot at least. And the whale shark is breathing the same way that sand tiger shark was breathing. Ram ventilation. It's pushing water over its gills. It's eating plankton. So remember, we, see, we didn't see any teeth in the mouth. So it's eating little things that's filtering. It has these special parts on its gills called gill rakers. It's kind of like little fans that stick out from the gills, but on the inside, so that when they swim through the water, those fans collect the food, and it'll eventually make it down its way into its stomach. They're not eating big fish. So they're not going to swallow a diver or anything. They're eating the little tiniest of things that are swimming around in the ocean called plankton. There's big plankton, but they're eating the little plankton. Here is... The basking shark. The basking shark is the second largest of all the sharks. Same thing. It has gill rakers. You can really see the insides of the gills right there. And it's filtering the food from the water, the little tiny food, the microscopic plankton. All right. Karen asks, do sharks dig? They sort of do. If they can sense their food in the water or in the sand, they might. Now, we forgot the very special sixth sense of a shark. Sixth sense? Sixth? Sixth? sense of a shark tongue twister for you this morning the sixth sense of a shark is electroreception they're called ampullae of lorenzini so these little pores on their face they can sense electricity within about four inches of their face so if they're finding their food in the sand like a crab or a clam and they can sense it's down there with that electroreception they could dig it out henry asked was fern born at the aquarium i don't think so Fern has had many babies here. I don't think this is Fern or if this is one of her babies. But Fern has had, I think, at least four to six pups with us just in the time that I've been here. And I've been here since 2013. So, and Fern's at least, I want to say, 12 to 15 years old. But I'm not positive. So she's had quite a number of pups here with us. But I don't think she was born here. We probably got her from another aquarium. Now, the Aquarium of the Pacific is in a partnership or Kind of like a group we call the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And that means we take care of our animals so well, we get this extra gold star on the list. It's part of all these groups of zoos and aquariums that are so good at taking care of their animals, so well maintained, that we get this extra special label where we're part of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And we share animals across this entire spectrum. So we might have a lot of baby grunt sculpins one day. It happens pretty frequently. And we might say, hey, is there another zoo or aquarium that would like some of these baby grunt sculpins? And, we'll say, and they'll say yes, and we'll send them some grunt sculpins. If we have animals that we need to move to another facility because maybe they need to participate in some of their own reproductive research, we had a sawfish go to another aquarium because she could have babies with their male, and their, or that species was critically endangered, so they wanted to look at what's the best way for them to have babies under human conditions or under or human care, so that's where she went to go help with that. So that's one of the cool things about the Aquarium of the Pacific is that we get to share knowledge and animals and expertise across the entire board of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Well, we are definitely out of time. We ran over, but that was cool of all your questions. I loved everybody viewing and learning about sharks today with me. We're going to have another program here at 11 o'clock, so stay tuned if you want to learn more at our Aquarium Online Academy. Now, don't forget, even if you weren't watching live, you can still email us questions at live at lbaop.org. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your Monday morning and afternoon.